Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Opto Sessions podcast. Today, it's a tremendous honor to welcome Jim Rogers to the show. Jim is not only the co-founder of the Quantum Fund, one of the most successful global investment funds, but he's also the mastermind behind the Rogers International Commodities Index. With an impressive educational background from Yale and Oxford University, Jim brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to our conversation. How are you doing today, Jim? I'm doing fine. Great. It's good to see you. Delighted to be here. And you're calling from Singapore? I am in Singapore, yes. We've actually had you on the show before, so it's great to catch up with you again. Uh, I thought we could start just about talking about your, uh, just your, your vast experience in investing over the many decades. So obviously your, your journey, um, including the co-founding the Quantum Fund at age 27, which achieved a 4,200% return over 10 years. How has that shaped your success in investing? What, what were the key factors do you think behind your success? Well, I guess the key factor was uh... technological innovation is causing unprecedented disruption. Opto is here to help take advantage of a world in flux. From AI to blockchain, find the stocks and ETFs related to 50 plus powerful growth trends. Just scan the QR code to download for free. I guess the key factor was uh, enormous curiosity and hard work. We loved what we were doing, and I didn't want to do anything else, and so I loved it. So did you, um, you just had a natural inclination towards, towards finance from the, and investing from a young age, and that led you down the career you've had? No, no, no. Uh, I knew nothing about uh, investing. I knew, it was on, I knew something happened in Wall Street in 1929. I knew it was not good. I didn't quite know what it was. I didn't know there was a difference in stocks and bonds back in those days, but it didn't take me too long to figure out, oh my gosh, this is, I love this. What you have to do is figure out what's going on in the world and then adjust and adapt and work accordingly. You figure out what's happening in the world, what's going to happen in the world, and you might be successful. I loved it. I didn't consider it work. I just love doing it. Yeah. And how, how did you learn uh, about how the economy and what was happening in the world influenced investments? Just from trial and error or was it just? Well, as I said, I didn't know anything about investing. I didn't know there was a difference in stocks and bonds. But every day I learned more and it was more and more curiosity and more and more fun. It was just, as I say, I didn't consider it work. I wanted to know everything everywhere and so i read and adjusted accordingly it yeah. was a lot of fun figuring out what was happening but in in my case in our case it was everywhere in the world we weren't just interested in new york we weren't just interested in stocks we were interested in everything in the world and you also retired quite early uh travel around the world for approximately three years uh, at the start of the century, what was the most interesting country you ever visited on that trip around the world? Well, looking back on it, I, I guess I would have to say it was China. Most people didn't realize much about China in those days. I remember going back to New York from a couple of trips to China, and I would say, oh my gosh, amazing things are happening in China. And in those days, everybody would say, no, 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 Japan, Japan, Japan. And I said, no, no, uh, it's actually happening in China. Well, you know the rest of the story. Japan fell apart and China became very successful. So that, um, that journey that took you through China, is that what led you to want to you know, move to Singapore and start investing in Asia? Well, I could see that that's where lots of great things were happening, new things were happening, uh, and that things were very cheap because most people didn't pay much attention to Asia in those days. Yeah. And, uh, you know the rest of the story. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I also wanted to ask how you would describe your investing style that you've built up over the years. Could you sum it up for us? 
Well, it basically, it was to buy low and sell high. <laughs> the problem was you had to figure out what was low and what was high because everything was changing. As I said, nobody even thought about China in those days, certainly in the early days. Uh, people did know that some good, good things were happening in Japan. But eventually, not after not too long, we could figure out that things were not good in Japan, that whatever was happening in Japan was going to fall apart and that we had to look other places. It's not just Japan and China, it was everywhere, but Japan and China were the major two, certainly Asian economies and places where things were happening. Yeah. It's interesting to talk about Japan. I think yesterday Japan hit an all-time high Finally, after I, I don't know how long it's been since the previous autumn high, but it's, it's a long period of time, something like 30 years or so. Well, it's been 34 years. Yeah. Uh, Japan made its old high in the late 70s. Uh, sorry, in uh, the late, late 70s, yes. And here we are, 19, uh, whatever this is, this is 2024. Yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously... There's a lot been happening in the global markets. One of the most interesting things about investing is things are always changing. Um, it's a, US markets surprised many over the last six months uh, with a sort of relentless rally to all time highs, which even is perpetuating even this week. Um, the Magnificent Seven, excluding like Tesla and Apple, which have been lagging a bit, have, have led the way. What's your outlook on the market's future direction uh, based on what you're seeing today? Well, I, I can see what everybody else is saying. You know, the America's making new highs, Japan's making new highs, China's depressed, but many places in the world are now doing well. Central banks around the world, most central banks have printed a lot of money and markets like a lot of easy money. When there's a lot of easy money, it has to go somewhere. And the obvious and easy place for it to go is into the markets investment markets and that's where it's been going and it's that's continuing the risk of course for the key ed is how long will this last you know japan made a new market after 34 years america's making a new market is this going to continue or is this going to be over next week if you know the answer tell us <laughs> tell us we all want to know yes um yeah, I mean, you bring up a it's very interesting dynamics over the last 20 years. Obviously, the Federal Reserve, U.S. Treasury have used various methods to drive liquidity into the financial markets, which seems to like prop it up, basically. Uh, this persistent put that doesn't allow it to have the normal business cycle that it used to because um, they don't want to feel the pain anymore. Uh, what could be the trigger for a market downturn that, that sort of, surpasses the ability for the Federal Reserve to intervene and stabilize markets like they have been doing, like I said, over the last 20 years. What, what, what possibly could, could stop them doing that? Well, Ed, if you can answer that, oh my gosh, you're going to be very, very rich. You know, you can do whatever you want. No, what will happen, uh, what has happened in the past is, you know, they print a lot of money, everybody gets happy, everybody makes successful investments everybody gets fat and sassy but then people start giving up smart people figuring out oh gosh this cannot go on much longer this cannot last forever things are too high things are too exuberant let's turn around and get out and go somewhere else i don't know when that will happen it may be happening now you see a lot of the signs that have always been there you have a lot of new investors coming in. They all think it's very easy. They yeah. think this is a wonderful way to make money. And oh my gosh, it's easy. Let's just buy, buy, buy. But eventually somebody realizes, oh, stocks are very expensive. This cannot go on forever. And I don't think we're there yet. I'm not selling short yet. But I do see the classic signs from previous markets when everybody starts piling in and everybody starts thinking it's easy and things get expensive. You know, most markets in the world have been going up. 
and getting have been getting very expensive. Japan is uh, China is down, but most other markets have been very successful. Yep. And it's uh, yeah, the timing's always difficult. It seems to be a, these squeezes can go on for much longer than people think are possible. Um, it normally goes on longer than people think it's possible because everybody says, "Oh, it's different now. It's yeah. different this time." But when you hear that it's different this time, Ed, be worried. Be very worried. Have you seen this before at some point in time? I mean, obviously there was the uh, um, the tech bubble. Oh yes, no, it's all I've seen it many times. Markets always get ahead of themselves. Markets get too expensive. There becomes too much exuberance. Everybody thinks it's not a problem. It's going to keep going on. That's when you have to start worrying. I'm worrying, but I'm not so worried yet that I'm, I'm actually selling short or anything. Yeah. But I am watching. Worry. I'm watching and worrying. Um, and so. How can people benefit from a market collapse or position themselves to not, not you know, be as um, worried if, you know, if, if there is a market collapse? Well, obviously, historically, if you can get it right, get your timing right, you sell. You sell when things are expensive. Uh, and if you're, if you're good at it, you can sell short. There are ways to make money when things go down if you can sell short. So the thing to do is, if you're a good timer, a good at timing, sell, sell all your investments, and then start selling short. If you can get the timing right, Ed, oh my gosh, you're going to be very rich, very happy. <laughs> and uh, how do you manage risk when shorting? Because obviously, there's you got to, when shorting. Obviously, the upside is well, infinity, isn't it? It can go to wherever it works, but you've always always got a, a low on, on, on the downside when you're investing long. Um, how do you manage that risk? Uh, as I said, if you can figure all this out, my gosh, you're going to be successful. <laughs> my gosh, you're going to have fun and be very popular and very successful. Uh, I don't know how to tell you how to do it. Everybody has their own way. Some people have a a rule that if things go against them by a certain percentage, say 10%, 15%, yeah. they close their position automatically. It works for some people. Uh, I don't have a, a solution to that question. I normally just wait till the pain gets very bad, and then I have to do something, and so I do. But I don't have, a, I have not developed a good answer over the years. And if we just move now on to, to China, um, China's trying to prop up its economy at the moment. It's, it's been uh, struggling a bit more than some of the other nations like the US, at, at least from the financial markets point of view. Um, they've been trying to stimulate the economy. Do you believe their efforts are going to be effective? China has been suffering in recent weeks, recent months. China had a very great period of prosperity in the markets for a while. We're sp speaking just about markets. Um, things got ahead of themselves. The Chinese markets have been weak because there was a lot of exuberance. Everybody was optimistic. Everybody think it would go on forever. Classic signs that always happen, you know, and now China's suffering in the markets. I don't know how to judge when it's coming to an end. I see the signs that it's coming to an end. Everybody's becoming very pessimistic. Everybody is worried. People are saying, oh, I'm going to give up. I'll never do this again. It's crooked. It's, yeah. it's not legitimate. These people are crooks. Uh, you see the signs. I don't see it. I see a lot of despair and I am looking for investments in China, but I haven't found anything yet. So these are, these are signs where it could be the time the market turns. Is that what you see when, it, when it's the highest amount of despair? I am seeing up? the signs that have happened before. Uh, again, they're classic signs. Markets go through these periods when people turn from great optimism to great despair. The despair is setting in in China. I am looking because I, I recognize the despair 
but I haven't found anything yet. Yeah. And how how did China get themselves into this situation? Have you like, obviously they've had a the real estate bubble has has, has started to pop. Um, have they have they just invested too much when thinking times were good and and you know when the economy started to falter, everything sort of started to collapse because of the amount of debt they're using. Well, I mean, China, China went through a big real estate bubble. Like many countries, this is not the first time the world has seen a, a real estate bubble. Beijing saw there was a bubble was developing. They did their best to slow it down at times, but everybody was very exuberant. When everybody gets exuberant, nobody believes anything can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Everybody says, yeah, oh, it's different this time. Don't worry, everything will be okay. It's never okay, Ed. If things get overextended and over optimistic, it's never okay. That's what happened in China. It kept going for a long time, it became one of the biggest property bubbles in the history of the world. Eventually, the central government tried to stop it, but they were not successful. But eventually, as always happens, the market said, okay, this is enough. We're not gonna, we're not gonna let things keep going higher and higher. And some people start selling and then more people start selling. Uh, and then eventually, as enough people start selling, you have a bear, bear market, you have a problem. That is what happened in China. Had a huge property bubble, one of the biggest in, in history because China is one of the biggest countries. There was a lot of easy money and it came to an end. Yep. And what future do you foresee for the US dollar amidst the uh, ongoing devaluation? Could the Chinese yuan ever challenge its dominance? Well, I own a lot of US dollars and I do because normally when things start getting bad, when there's turmoil, people look for a safe haven. And historically, in our lifetime, the US dollar has been a safe haven. They, people think it's a safe place to put money. By the way, there's no such thing as a safe haven. It never has been, but at various times, people think something is a safe haven. And in the past few years, it has been the US dollar. People think, oh, when things get bad, let's put the money in the U.S., in the U.S. dollar. They have continued to do that, including me. But I know that eventually I'm going to have to get out of my U.S. dollars and put the money somewhere else. I am not doing that yet, but I am looking. <laughs> and what, what other assets are you interested in? I mean, you're a commodities man historically. Is that, do you, have you still got a big interest in gold? Well, I own some gold. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I have some silver. I have some gold. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but historically gold and silver have been places where people can ride out storms, but yeah, gold and silver go down too. They have many times in various markets uh, when people start getting worried even gold and silver can go down, at least for a while. They go down, eventually they hit bottom. They often have hit bottom first and tend to start turning around when people look for somewhere to put their money. But don't think gold and silver cannot go down, and they certainly have in the past. I hope I see many times when they go down. You know, I hope I get it right. <laughs> um and what about the geopolitical climate at the moment? The world's obviously, it's very volatile. There's a lot of, you know, a couple of wars going on, high profile wars. Um, do you foresee an era of ongoing political and social unrest? Um, well, you, you see the same things I do. There are places where people are getting, well, they're getting worried about something and they start sh shouting at each other. And sometimes they start shooting at each other. That has started happening. Uh, historically, you have these small wars 
that turn into big wars. At the moment, we have a couple of small wars, as you have pointed out, uh, and they don't seem to be ending yet. And historically, these small wars sometimes turn into big wars. That does seem to be happening at the moment. And if, I mean, if they turn into a really big war, everybody suffers a lot. A lot of assets are destroyed. A lot of lives are destroyed. And people eventually say, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Let's not, let's not do that again. Yeah. But for hundreds of years, people have realized this is not a good thing. This war is crazy, but they still do it. You know, in 1914, usually at the beginning of many wars, people are optimistic. They say, oh, don't worry. Those are terrible people. We will destroy them quickly. The boys will be home by Christmas or something like that. Unfortunately, then it doesn't end and people try to figure out how to get out of it but they don't know what to do. And then, you know, when the First World War started, everybody was very optimistic that it would be over soon. After a few weeks or a few months, oh my gosh, they were all figuring out, how do we get out of it? How did this happen, first of all? And second, how do we get out of it? And that's the problem. How do you get out of it after these things get started? So moving on now to um, thinking about more of the future. Have you got any thoughts on, I don't know if you heard of anything, the exponential age, this sort of era of rapid technological innovation underpinned by advancements in AI um, and its potential to significantly increase GDP through increased productivity, which could, could lead us to the next growth phase in the economy. I don't know if you've had any time to think about these sort of things and how it might impact markets. Well, we've often had change, technological change, whether the technological change is electricity or automobiles or whatever it's been in the past. Some major technological change comes along. Everybody gets excited. They think it's going to be a huge change that will last forever. And they get more and more overconfident, and that leads to too much excess and big bull markets. This is not the first time we've had too much excess, success and excess, and it's happening again. And that too, we have a couple of wars now, as you point out, if we start having more wars, they get bigger and bigger and people don't know how to get out of them. Have you, have you thought about, so there's been a lot of talk about AI replacing jobs um, and things like this. Do you think that might be an issue, a feature in the, down the line that um, they're not, there's not as many jobs available for people because they are AI in various companies and the software and uh, has, has enabled individuals to do more um, so that you need less people in, in these companies. Do you think, what, what are your thoughts on that? It's always happened. It's happened many times in history. As I said, electricity led to excess. Automobiles led to excess. Many things led to excess. Uh, people get very optimistic and they always said, oh, it's different this time. When you hear people say it's different this time, be very careful, Ed. It's never different. We always had periods of excess and over optimism and, and too much success in investing. But that always leads to problems down the road. So be worried. I'm worried I'm not doing anything about it yet. I mean, I'm not selling short yet, but I certainly see the signs that are developing. I doubt if I will get the timing right. I, I rarely do, but I do know that excess always leads to over exuberance and excesses. It always has been going on for hundreds of years. If you weren't around for hundreds of years, you can read about them because yeah. it's happened before. So you think the market's getting ahead of itself, it, basically? It's thinking this change will be too impactful too early? Well, I know it's uh, the excess is developing. 
that most mini markets are making all time highs. You know, even Japan, which has not made a market for 34 years, is making a new high now after 34 years. America's at new highs. Many countries are making new highs. Maybe it's going to go on forever, Ed. Never <laughs> has, but maybe it will this time. If stocks, whatever, are making all time highs, typically, you know, at the right time is seen as a, as a, as a, as a bullish indicator, but are you saying on the flip side of that, it, you know, it's also a warning sign because at some point, it, you know, that's, that can't go on forever. Well, it never has gone on forever. I know that. Uh, how that there have been periods when people think it will go on forever, or maybe at least it will go on for a lot longer. I mean, the classic signs are there. Many stock markets are making all-time highs. There's exuberance everywhere or many places. People say it is different this time. I mean, maybe Japan is going to go on for another 34 years of new highs. I doubt it. You know, Japan has huge, huge problems. Staggering debt has built building up in Japan. The population has been declining for 14 or 15 years. That's not a typo. Japanese population has been declining for many years. Debt has been rising for many years. People say everything is okay now. The central bank has figured it out. <laughs> Nobody's ever figured it out. Even though people think somebody has figured it out, they never really have. I think the central banks are, are, seems to be some of the worst predictors of what the economy will actually do based on their forecasts. Um, central banks rarely get it right, but maybe this time is different. So we talked about earlier, you, you moved to Singapore uh, 2007, I believe to take advantage of the investment opportunities there. Where, where do you see as the next major investment opportunity? Is there a country or theme that you're specifically interested in? Well, I don't see many markets that are cheap and where there's a lot of despair. Uzbekistan I have invested in a bit and will invest more. Uzbekistan was ruined by the communists. Uh, the communists ruined many places. Uh, you know, the Soviet communists, but lots of movements have come along and been destructive of capital throughout history. Uzbekistan was ruined by the communists, but now there, I think there are now people who are running the things in a proper way. They're trying to develop proper industry, proper savings, proper investing. I, it's, they sound like they're doing the right thing. You can ask me in two or three years if they did it right or not, but I have started. But there are not many places now yet. There's too much exuberance, too much optimism in many places of the world now, except China. But I'd say other than Uzbekistan or other than China, I don't know many places where there are great opportunities now. And how do in Uzbekistan are you are you looking at private investments, public investments? How do you approach the opportunities there? Well, there is a stock market. Um, the stock market has not been overly optimistic. You know, the government, the communists ruined Uzbekistan, as I said. Uh, then, as often happens when a country has problems. A new crowd of people come along and say, okay, we're not going to make those mistakes before we've read about those mistakes. We're not going to invest too much. We're not going to get too optimistic. And for a while, things will be great. But then they'll get over exuberant. Everybody will say it's different now. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. When you hear everybody say, don't worry, you should worry, Ed. But Uzbekistan, I don't think, is at that stage yet. And you're also um, obviously a, a very successful commodity investor. How, how might commodities be considered undervalued at the moment? Uh, you, you'll have to ask me in a year or two, but at the moment, I don't see too, too much excess in the commodity investing world. 
uh, you, you don't have wild optimism and wild confidence in most commodities at the moment. It may get there, but most commodities are still ignored by most people. Yeah. Um, and what sort of commodities do you typically look at? Are we talking gold, the traditional gold, silver again? Well, gold is making all time highs. If I were buying gold or silver today, I would buy silver. I mean, it's down 50 or 60% from its all time high. Gold is making all time highs. So on a historic basis anyway, silver is probably better than gold. I own both. I'm not buying either at the moment, but I would buy silver if I were buying something today. And in your opinion, what, what qualities make a successful investor? Oh my gosh. Wouldn't we all like to have the, I'd love to have the answer to that. You know, um, the ability to buy something that's cheap, that's being ignored by people, where there's positive change. Historically, historically, if you can find positive change uh, that has been ignored, it usually leads to great opportunities. If people don't see the change or do, don't understand the positive change that's taking place, it often leads to opportunities. And do you have um, a personal experience that taught you a significant like, lesson about risk from your history? Yeah, I've lost a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I wish it were, I wish it were easier enough. So all I could say was, oh, okay, now I understand. There's not much risk anymore. Things are cheap enough. Something good is going to happen. No, whenever that starts happening. Well, you have to look at things and his, history is one lesson. As I said, if you look at gold and silver right now, gold is near its all time high. Silver is down a lot from its all time high. That does not mean you should buy silver, even though it has often meant that. And as I say, if I were buying one of them today, I would be buying silver today because it is depressed from an all-time high. But that does not mean it cannot get more depressed. <laughs> it's often happened. Yeah. And do you have any books, invest, investing books that have influenced you that you, you could recommend? Books you've read? Well, well there have been lots of investing books, investing books throughout history. Many of them have the solution, but... No, I, I wish I found, had found, I mean, I remember reading Security Analysis by Graham and Dodd back 50 or 60 years ago. It was, a, they were brilliant, brilliant at talking about what makes markets make bottoms and how to buy. But you still have to understand it and you have to get, it's not just the facts that have you have to get right. You have to worry about other investors too. The problem is you and I can sit and say, this is cheap. It's cheap today and it's cheap on a historic basis, but you have to worry about other people. Just cause you and I see something. If other people don't see it too, you can lose your shirt. The problem is there are lots of other investors in the world, some of whom, some of whom know what they're doing, some of whom don't. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jim. It's been great to, to chat to you. If, if, is there one bit of parting advice you could leave for fellow investors before we wrap up? Well, yes. Um, everybody should be very careful. Everybody should be worried. Now, just because you're worried doesn't mean you will get it right. But everybody should always be worried about the investment world. And if you are worried, chances are you will prepare yourself and chances are you'll get it right. The main lesson I would say is be worried. And if you're worried, you'll get prepared and you might survive. Well, thanks, Jim. Um, Jim's also writ written a, a lot of his own 
Invest in books, which are available still on Amazon, I believe. Um, so please go check them out. Thanks again, Jim, for, for, for your time. And uh, yeah, hope to catch up again in the future. Well, I'm, Ed, if you can come up with a book that's got the answer that will save us all, please tell us. <laughs> you know, I can remember when I was a, history, I was a professor at a time or two, the students always wanted me to tell them which chapter, which page, where, where are the answers? And I would always try to explain to them, in, there is no chapter three. There is no page 37. You know, there is no way to get the answer. You have to worry and think and do your homework and research. And even then you might get it wrong. I don't have a solution yet. If you have it, tell us all. I'll try and look for that, Jim. <laughs> Very good. Thanks again. Thank you, Ed.